two of our series. Are we doing okay out there with sound? We good? Uh, part two of our series uh, entitled, Who Do You Think You Are? And uh, we started it a while back, and I missed several Wednesdays, and thank you to all those that, that helped hold the fort down on those Wednesdays that we were gone. But we're going to get back into it tonight, and, and I believe that this series really does have the potential to truly affect our life, uh, because we're talking about who we are, uh, not who we are as far as who we look at in the mirror, but, but who God says we are. How many know that's important? To allow Him to define us, to allow Him to shape the image to allow him to speak into our life and say, this is who you are, not what anybody else around you says. And I, I believe it's very, very important for us to allow God to shape our identity, to shape who we are, because the truth is we all struggle, don't we, with people around us and trying to please people. How many know we all struggle with that, don't we? We all struggle with that. Um, but you know what? And, and that's something that we all struggle with. But, but God doesn't want us to, to, to have to be in bondage to that. God doesn't want you and I to uh, believe who we are based upon what other people say. Because you know how many know one day somebody can say something good about you, the next day, mm, we won't talk about that. And God doesn't want us to shape our belief about who we are, about what other people say about us, what other people think about us what life says about us. I mean, no, there's times that you can look around in your life and I can look around in my life, and if we come up with who we are based upon we see what we see, it may not be a good picture, right? And God says, I don't want you to use those things, what other people say, life circumstances, how you feel. Don't use your faults, your failures. Don't use your past. Don't use any of those things ever to define who you are. Because if we do, then all we'll do is we'll be held in bondage to those things. God says, I want you to allow me to define who you are. And we're all vulnerable to the thoughts, the opinions, the ideas of people around us. You know, we're all vulnerable to those things. And that's why I believe it's so important for us to just instill in all of our hearts and all of our lives with as much knowledge, as much information, as much ammunition as we can to build strength into our life so that we don't fall prey to those things. Amen? God doesn't want us to live like that. Here's another real strong reason why I believe that you and I need to allow God to shape our identity, to be the one who speaks into our life, is because, now, now hang on, all right, you got your spiritual seatbelts on? The level of spiritual maturity that we operate at will always be paved in the truth of our identity. Let me say it again. The level of our spiritual maturity that we operate in will always be paved with the truth of who we are, what our identity is. Our, our, our success in life, our spiritual maturity, the level that we operate spiritually as far as being mature or immature, wherever we are spiritually, will always be directly connected to who we believe we are. You know why we get offended when people look at us wrong? Hello. Why we get hurt when people say things to us that we don't like? I'll just let you figure that one out. And you know, we all fall prey to that, don't we? God says, I want to I build some, some strength into you. I want to I empower you. And, and, and our spiritual maturity will grow as we allow our identity to be shaped by Christ. As we allow God to be the one that says, here you are. This is who you are. I'm the one that designed you. As I was preparing and kind of wrapping up these thoughts today, God spoke this to me. You can never live any more successfully than our identity will allow us to. Let me say that to you again. You can never live any more successfully than your identity will allow you to. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says this, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So you know that what that scripture says to us is that if I believe that I'm worthless, 
If I believe that I'm insecure, that I amount to nothing, that life has no meaning, that I'm a failure, then everything about my life will be lived at that level. We will make decisions based upon that level. We will, we will just, everything about our life flows from our identity. How many know what I'm talking about tonight? And you know, the truth is that God spends our entire life trying to get us to believe that we are who He says we are, that we can do what He says we can do, that we have what He says we have. And our identity in Christ, let me say this on the flip side, our identity in Christ is not denying our weaknesses. It is empowering us to deal with them. To say that I am this in Christ, and we're going to talk about one of these traits tonight, there's actually about 29 different traits in the New Testament that, you, that God uses to define us. But it's not to deny our weaknesses. It is to empower us to overcome them. Because, see, we do live in two worlds, don't we? We live in the world, the natural world, where we're in contact with all of our faults and all of our failures. I mean, we can't get away from that, right? But we also live in the kingdom of God, where, where God says has truth about us. And we need to live and operate from this standpoint, what God says for us, and deal with everything over there. Does that make sense to you? So we need to allow God to shape our identity, to help us to overcome our weaknesses and, and be empowered in His strength. Now, we said to you the last time that the, when we begin to talk about who we are in Christ and, and our first identity, we said that God says that you're a new creation. Now, that's key, isn't it? How many know you're a new creation? Now, you know, that's one of those things uh, that in Christianity, we say it so many times, we hear it so many times, that it can just become a cliche. It can just become, yeah, I'm a new creation. But you know what? When you say you're a new creation, you are speaking volumes about who you are. I mean, you're speaking magnitudes of volumes. Uh, uh, the very moment that you gave your life to Christ, that I gave my life to Christ, the very moment that we were saved, we became a new creation. Now, your appearance may not have changed. If you were bald before you got saved, you're still bald. If you had a big belly when you got saved, you still got a big belly. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but... Your surroundings didn't change. A lot of things about your life didn't change immediately, but one thing that did change was your identity. You became a new creation in Christ. And it's very important. The reason why we started off there is because everything else, for as long as we talk about this, is going to be something that comes out of that new creation. It is going to be identity trait that we pull from the fact that God made you and I a new creation. We read last time that because we're a new creation, old things have passed away and all things have become new. Everybody say all. All, all things have become new. And the rest of our life is to be defined by what God says that new creation is. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going we're gonna to talk about another, another uh, identity trait that God says, this is who you are. From heaven's perspective, when I look at you, this is your identity. This is who you are. This is the way I want you to live. This is what I want you to operate from. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 Paul begins to define what this new creation is all about. Some of this is familiar with us, but it's a part of the foundation that we need to lay as we move through this over the next month or so. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for you, that you might become the righteousness of God in him. If you're a new creation, how many new creations in here? You've been born again. The Bible says that you are, say, I am the righteousness of God. Say, I am the righteousness of God. That's who you are. Now, that's a mouthful, too, because I tell you, that's everything about what Christianity is all about. It's what, to be the righteousness of God is what every other religion in this world is striving for, to be in right standing with God. You're the righteousness of God. I'm the righteousness of God. And we can declare that we're the righteousness of God. 
I tell you what, you find yourself getting a little depressed, you find yourself getting a little down, a little fearful, a little worried, and you just step up and begin to walk around and talk about the fact that you're the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And you watch what will happen on the inside of you. It will begin to stir. It will begin to become real on the inside of you. It will rise up from inside. It will register on your mind, and it will quicken your mortal body. It will bring life to you. You're the righteousness of God. That's who you are. Now, see, this topic sometimes can get religious folk a little upset. Like, how can you call yourself the righteousness of God? Don't you know you're a sinner? Well, I got news for you. We're not sinners. Hello? Sin made to, being a sinner may define some of our actions, but that's not who you are. You're the righteousness of God. I'm the righteousness of God. What does that mean? It means I'm in right standing with God. It means you're in right standing with God. You've been reconciled. You've been brought close. That's who you are. And you know, the thing about why it's so important for us to grasp the fact that we're the righteousness of God is because the devil has you and I working overtime if we don't, if we don't grab a hold of this truth, trying to be the righteousness of God, trying to do things to impress God, trying to be the righteousness of God, trying to act right. How many know what I'm talking about? Trying to be righteous, but the thing that we need to understand is righteousness is not an action. I mean, have you ever heard that righteousness is an action? It's not an action. Righteousness is a position. Righteousness is a position that you and I have because of the identity that God has given to us. That identity, what is that position? I'm in right standing with God. You're in right standing with God. That's who you are. And it's very important for us to grasp a hold of this truth because we'll spend our entire Christian life trying to earn that position with God, trying to earn that right standing with God, trying to please God. Lord, I prayed an hour today. Are you happy with me now? Lord, I, I went to church on Sunday morning. Are you happy with me now? Lord, I paid my tithes. Are you happy with me now? Lord, I did this. Are you happy with me now? Trying to earn that right standing with God. And God says to us, being the righteousness of God has got nothing to do with how you act. It has to do with who you are. Now, the key is to allow who you are to affect how you act so that you can produce the fruits of righteousness. Everybody say this with me again. I am the righteousness of God. And sometimes religious people get a little upset and say, you know, how can you call yourself the righteousness of God as if it was our idea, as if we're making it up? But what we need to realize is the fact that we're the righteousness of God, it's not our idea. We didn't come up with it. It's not our plan. It's not our design. It's all God's idea. It's all God's doing. All we did was step into it. He opened the door through Christ and said, come on in. I made him who knew no sin to be sin for you that you might become the righteousness of God. And that becoming is not a process. Once you step into Christ through the new birth, you have become, you have arrived. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. And because it was God's plan, it was because it was a part of his plan for our life, he had a very specific reason for it. He had a very specific reason for making us the righteousness of God. And he also had a very specific plan for making us the righteousness of God. And it's just awesome that God took care of it all. You know, there's, there's this, this truth that sometimes when you, when you try to explain it, it's hard to explain, but, but there's power in it. And that is, God doesn't expect you and I to do anything except let Christ live through us. Why don't you think about that for just a second? See, that's Christianity as it, at its purest form. That's what Paul said when he said, it's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. 
And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That I'm free. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. That's who I am. It's no longer about me performing. It's no longer about me trying to be good. It's no longer with me trying to live up to some certain level. It it has to do with me just allowing the fact that I am who God says I am and allowing that to absorb into my life to change my thought process and realize I just need to relax in Christ. I just need to rest in Christ. And in that resting, I will find power to live. And it will no longer be I who live, but it will be Christ who lives in me. Why? Because it's no longer rusty. It's no longer you. It's Christ and his righteousness. Does that make sense to you? And sometimes you have to, you have to get really quiet and really still and, and lay your thoughts and, and, and the way we live and the hustle and bustle of life, lay all that down and just stop. And if you'll stop and pause and be quiet, you'll hear God say that in your heart. Just rest. Just rest. Just let me be your shepherd. Because you're the righteousness of God. Understand that you're the righteousness of God, that that's who you are, that that's who I am, is what empowers us to do that. If we don't understand that, then we're going to be working hard and wearing ourselves out and, and trying to put the square peg into the round hole in our Christian life, trying to live for God. When God says, you can't live for me, you just need to relax in who I say you are and allow me to live through you. It brings us, it brings such strength to us. See, when we understand this, this right standing with God and what he's done for us in this new creation, it's amazing. It will overwhelm you. And I tell you, it will overwhelm us and it will amaze us because it makes Christianity so simple. I mean, that's one of the things that Paul says to Timothy. He said, I, I fear I fear that, that Satan has made Christianity, I'm paraphrasing, made Christianity complex. He's taken the simplicity out of it and through deception the way he did Adam and Eve in the garden. How many know that, that the more complex something is, the more flesh is involved, the more reasoning is involved, the more the enemy is involved, the more deception that is involved. The closer you get to God, the more of the truth that we walk in, the simpler things get. The simple, it doesn't matter how chaotic it is around us. I'm talking about inside. It brings peace to us and it brings a security to us. I was, I was just kind of flipping through the page, uh, the internet, the pages, the internet pages on the internet site. Uh, and I saw that uh, today that a guy, um, PayPal, let me know what PayPal is. How many saw that? Oh my word. They made a mistake and they deposited 92 quadrillion dollars into this person's account. 92 quadrillion dollars. And when he saw it, he was amazed and he was overwhelmed, but it didn't take long for them to go, "Uh uh-oh, we made a mistake. But you know what? The fact that we've been made the righteousness of God is worth to us a far more than just that money is and God didn't make a mistake and he's not taking it back. I really want us to get this on the inside of us because some of us are laboring in our Christianity. We're laboring and trying to please God. We're laboring and trying to please others. We're laboring in in different aspects of our life, trying to to do this thing called Christianity. And God said, just relax, you're the righteousness of God. That's who you are. You don't have to perform. All you got to do is just chill out and, and just recognize. And you will, if you will do that, you will find power in that position. You will find power in that position. I didn't make a mistake when I called you the righteousness of God. It's God's idea. It's God's design. It's God's gift. It's God's plan for our life. When you stepped into it, that's who you became. And God wants us to take full advantage of it. He wants, because see, we can be, we can be the righteousness of God and miss all the blessings of it. 
We can have the label of God, the identity of God spoken over our life because we're in Christ, but yet not be walking in the blessings of it, not be walking in what that truly means to our life. That's why Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, awake to righteousness. Awake to righteousness. Don't be asleep to it. Awaken yourself to it. Why are we talking about this? I'm going to go back to what I said a while ago because we can never live any more successfully than our identity will allow us to. When we get a glimpse or get a hold of the truth that we're the righteousness of God and all the other truths that we're going to be talking about, it will raise the level of success in our life. You know why I can have a better marriage? Because I'm the righteousness of God. Why, you can have a better marriage? Because you're the righteousness of God. Why, your finances can increase? Because you're the righteousness of God. Why, you can walk into work tomorrow when everybody else is tripping because of everything that's going on around, and you can have peace because you're the righteousness of God. When somebody just is mad and, and just chewing you out, and you can stand there with a smile on your face, because you're the righteousness of God. Are you with me? It empowers us. It truly empowers us on the inside. Because it's a position before God. And when we yield to that position, we get the power of God in, in, involved in our life. And God gave us this position for one reason, one main reason. Because He wants to walk with us. Because he wants to walk with us. And to the degree that we understand that we're in right standing with him will be to the degree that we will have a close, intimate relationship with him. How many just enjoyed worship all ago? You know why you enjoyed it? Because you're the righteousness of God in Christ. Because you were act, you know, you know, you know acting upon your right standing with God brings God's presence into your life. In fact, Isaiah 32, we're not going to get there tonight, so I'm going to go ahead and share this with you. Isaiah 32 says that the effects of righteousness, the effects of righteousness or the works of righteousness will be quietness, peace, and confidence for my people. That's the effects of righteousness. So whenever you and I understand that we're in right standing with God, I have this right relationship with God. It's not based upon my works, my energy, my effort. It's just based upon he's the one that says it. He's the one that says that's who you are, and I have embraced that truth. When I live and operate and act upon that truth, it produces what the Bible calls the fruits of righteousness. And the fruits of righteousness are confidence, peace, assurance in our heart. So earlier when we were, whether we were aware of it or not, when we were worshiping, we were acting upon our right standing with God. And when you act upon your right standing with God, you get the power of God released into your life. That's why it's so important for us to understand that. Because God wants us to walk with Him. God wants us to experience Him. And it all happens when we, when we realize who we are. You know, it also means this. It means you're justified in His sight. Not only do, are you in right standing with Him, but you're justified. What does justified mean? It means, it means you're, it's justified, never sinned. Now, that's a big one, isn't it? It means that you're pure before God. You're pure before Him. How many believe that? Now, we struggle with that, though, don't we? But we are, we are. When God looks at you, he doesn't, he doesn't see your faults and your failures. He sees who he says you are. And he keeps focusing on that, trying to pull you and I into that. When we focus, so we see people's faults and failures, don't we? I was reading, and this will be in a couple of weeks, but I was doing some studying the other day and reading some articles and stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely a proven fact that in our interactions with one another, when we communicate and talk with each other, that um, for, every, for every one word of encouragement that we speak, we speak seven words of negativity. 
For every one word, we speak seven negative comments. For every one positive comment that we have, we speak seven negative comments. Oh, I love you. Well, why'd you do it that way? Are you ever going to do it right? Who are you looking for, Bobby? <laughs> we all do that. But you know, when it comes to God, he's not like that. He's not speaking one word of encouragement and seven negative words against us. Everything he is speaking is directly into who he says trying to pull us into that. Now, this being justified, it took God a lot to, to offer this, to put this package together. So I want to go with me real quick to 1 John chapter 1, and I'm going to give you three things that God did out of His own heart to make sure that we could become the righteousness of God. Now, this scripture that we're reading, it's, it's mainly written to believers Oh, it, I like to call it the maintenance scripture for believers when we mess up. But the principle here is the same for those coming out of the old life into the new life. Three things that God did that apply to us that make us the righteousness of God. And we need to understand these just to, because the more knowledge, the more understanding we have, the clearer these truths become. Here's what John writes in 1 John chapter 1 verse 8. In 9, he says, If you say then you have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, God, in, in the context that we're talking about, the fact that we are the righteousness of God uh, that gives us the ability to identify with that, God did three things for you and I so that we could become this person. The first thing that he, see, he says, we see here, John says, you are forgiven. How many feel forgiven? How many always feel forgiven? We don't always feel forgiven, do we? Sometimes we battle with it especially when we, make, when we make mistakes. But you know what? God says that in this identity of the righteousness of God in Christ, you are forgiven. So if I believe that anytime I mess up because I'm forgiven, I need to get forgiveness. I don't have to worry about it. It's already there. I'm forgiven. You're forgiven in this identity. In righteous standing with God, you are forgiven. And what forgiveness means is that God has released us from the punishment that our sin rightfully deserves. Man, isn't that a, something that'll just take your breath away? How many are glad you're not being punished for all your mistakes? God's not dropping all of heaven on our heads because we've blown it, because we've made mistakes. Why? Because we're forgiven. So God's not holding anything against us. Now see, religion really messes all this up, but Christianity makes it really, really simple. And that is, you're forgiven even, even before you make mistakes. It's out there for us. And if you miss it, if you make mistakes, and all you have to do is draw upon that forgiveness. God says you are forgiven. I have released you from the penalty of punishment that rightfully belongs to you because you've broken my laws, because you've disobeyed me. And if you will walk in the righteousness of God, you will experience the forgiveness that belongs to you. He says you are forgiven. And he shows us here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 12, how important this forgiveness is to God when it comes to our life. He says, 1 John chapter 2, verse 12, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. God said, I did it. I did it so much because I love you. And for my namesake, because that's who I am. I can't, I can't help myself. I forgive you for my namesake. Because I want to forgive you. Because I want you to be forgiven. Because I want you to have a new identity. I want you to be a new creation. I want you to be the righteousness of God. So I offer this plan of forgiveness. And if you receive it, you can walk in it. Now, where did this forgiveness take place at? The cross. We know that. The fact that Christ hung on the cross signified to all the world 
that God offers forgiveness to all who want it. Now, the next thing that we see here, maybe you've never seen it kind of broken down this, this way before, but just the forgiveness is not enough. You need more than forgiveness. Forgiveness is a part of the plan. The next thing that we see in verse 9, he says, he forgives our sins and cleanses us. Forgiveness and cleansing are two different things. So not only are you forgiven, see you were forgiven at the cross, but there's also a cleansing that needs to take place. God says the forgiveness belongs to everybody. Are you with me? It's out there. It's just like it's out there. But being forgiven is not enough. You need to be cleansed. What cleanses us? The blood. The cross signifies that forgiveness is available for everybody. The blood that was shed at the cross is what cleanses us and washes us. Forgiveness releases us from the wrath and the punishment of God. But the blood is what cleanses us. And how many know when the blood cleanses us, it doesn't leave any sin residue? I mean none. Everybody say none. So how many have been cleansed? That means there should be no sin residue at all in your life. And listen, any sin residue that we have in our life, you know what it's the result of? Stepping out of your identity. Stepping out of the identity of Christ. Stepping away from the fact that I'm a new creation. Stepping out of the fact that I'm the righteousness of God. Are you following me? That's why I've said to you before, and I know it's a little strong, but we don't have a sin problem in Christianity. What we have is a lack of identifying who Christ says to us and allowing that to empower us to live out. You do that, you deal with a sin problem. The sin residue in our life is because we've stepped out of the new creation and gone our own way. The sin residue in our life is because we've stepped out of being the righteousness of God and gone our own way. But God says, the blood cleanses you. The blood washes you. The blood sets you free. And when it does, there's no sin residue left at all. You are completely restored. King David understood this when he uh, had sin in his life and he messed up and made some major mistakes. And as he was pouring out his heart before God, he said in Psalms 51 verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, let me say this. He, he goes on in the next verse, and this is where we have to understand the difference between Old Testament and New Testament, Old Covenant and New Covenant. He goes on to the next verse and says, My sin is ever before me. Because under the Old Covenant, the blood that washed was the blood of bulls and goats. And that didn't cleanse the conscience. It just covered the sin. That's why he says, my sin is ever before me. It's still there. There's still residue there. It's just covered. But when you come over under the new covenant, the blood doesn't doesn't cover our sin. There are songs that we sing. We've changed the words. We don't sing that the blood covers us anymore because the blood doesn't cover our sin. The blood washes us from our sin. I mean, it completely removes it. It boggles our mind, but that's the truth. In fact, if any sin was left, we're in trouble. Because how many know it only takes one to separate you from God? And David said, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Here's what happens with sin when it's in our life in relationship to our identity. When you and I sin, when we mess up, it inflicts things on our heart. Guilt, condemnation, unworthiness. How many know what I'm talking about? Sorrow. All of those things that were removed by the new creation. All of those things that our new identity brings us out of. So when we mess up, when we sin, when we get out of our our, our, uh, identity in Christ and we do our own thing, 
then what we're doing is we're inflicting guilt and condemnation and all the insecurities and the unworthiness. And when that gets into our heart, when that stuff begins to resonate in our heart, guess what? We are saved, sanctified, under the blood, blessed, but unable to receive the benefits of it because now our heart's weak. Our heart's separated from God. Our heart is separated from God. Our identity is messed up. How many know that when you've got sin in your life, it's hard to lift your hands and worship in freedom? Are you with me? And see, that's the whole tactic of the enemy, to get us involved in things that even though we're the righteousness of God, even though we're a new creation, if he can get us involved in stuff where he can put guilt and insecurity, inferiority and worthlessness into our heart, even though that's not us, he derails everything. And everything gets messed up. Under the old covenant, the blood covered the sin, but under the new covenant, the blood washes us. What does it wash us? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 says this, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience? How many know a clean conscience is worth more than 92 quadrillion dollars? Now, some of you may not believe that, but I promise you it is. It's like, can I just have a bad conscience for a while? No. But see, the blood cleanses our conscience. And when your conscience is cleansed, who you are in Christ rises to the ascendancy. And you can walk in the confidence of being the righteousness of God. So the the cross symbolized the forgiveness that God was offering to the world. The blood cleanses us from everything that we in, haven't been involved in, washes us from all sin. The next thing that we needed, because that's not enough, there's one more thing that God had to do, and I'm going to wrap it up with this. We had to be reconciled back to God. And what that means is this. Let me just read Second Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. It says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh... He has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses and wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us and having taken them out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. We're forgiven at the cross. We're washed with the blood. We are reconciled to God through the death of Jesus. What reconciliation means is this is it, it means to destroy everything in between two parties. He tore down every wall, every requirement. He nailed them to the cross. Now, he's mainly talking about the law here. How many know we don't live under the law anymore? It's good to memorize the Ten Commandments. It's good to teach the kids the Ten Commandments. But we do not live under the Ten Commandments anymore. We live under the New Commandment. Two commandments. How many know what they are? Walk by faith, walk in love. You do those two things, you'll get all ten of the other ones taken care of. We don't live under the Ten Commandments. If we're still living under the Ten Commandments, we're going to fall short. So we were reconciled to God through the death. Every barrier, every wall, everything that separated us from God has been removed through His death. Romans chapter 5, verse 10. For if then we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Our new identity is the fact that we're the righteousness of God in Christ. We are in right standing with God. We are justified before God. Why? Because we're forgiven We're cleansed and we're reconciled through the death, the blood, and the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what that means, I'll take everything up, and you've heard this before, but let me take this entire message and wrap it up right here in this one phrase. Because we are the righteousness of God, it gives us the ability to stand in the presence of God 
without the sense of guilt or inferiority as if sin never existed. I mean, that registers in your heart. You just sense the liberty and the freedom, being the righteousness of God, identifying, walking in that identity, walking in the fact that you're forgiven, walking in the fact that you're cleansed, walking in the fact that you've been reconciled to God and not violating those things. Because you're resting in those things, you're allowing Christ to live through you, gives you the ability to stand in the presence of God without the sense of guilt or inferiority as if sin never existed. It's what gives you and I the ability to do what Paul said when he said, come boldly before the throne with confidence and assurance and walk with God because you are the righteousness of God in Christ. I said this to you a while ago. Isaiah 32, 17 says, the work of righteousness will be peace. The effect of righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. Who are you? You're the righteousness of God in Christ. That's who you are. We may mess up, we may slip up, but that's not who you are. You're the righteousness of God. And God says, I just want you to grab a hold of it. I want you to meditate on this. I want you to think about it. And I want you to protect that right standing with God and learn to live out of it. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for tonight. Thank you that you have done a lot of work on our behalf through Jesus so that we could be made the righteousness of Christ. Thank you, Lord, that's who we are. That's our identity. We no longer live in our unrighteousness. We live in your righteousness through faith in Christ. Father, I just pray that that you would just help us all to understand this truth greater and greater as the days and the weeks, Father, move forward in our life. Help us to walk and protect that right standing with you and don't to do things that violate it, that give the enemy the ability to hinder the blessings that go with it, Lord. But if we do, help us to get right back on, to, to repent, to get things square with you, Father, so that we can move forward. And Father, I speak blessing over every person here, over every family and every area of their life. In Jesus' name, and everybody said. Amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap tonight? Thank you, guys. We love you. We'll see you back here Sunday morning at 1030. God bless you.